Welcome to the Lightning Ridge Environmental Awareness Course. My name's Steve Clipperton and my colleague Mark Bucken also joins us. Um, he and I are both inspectors being the resources regulator um, and um, we're here to talk about uh, the environment in Lightning Ridge and how that impacts on your ability to claim and how the way you manage your claims can impact on the environment. Now, the Environmental Awareness Course is a condition of claim in OPA4, Barfield and Wyoming. It's designed to increase your awareness of environmental issues uh, with open mining and, and assist claim holders in complying with their environmental conditions, which we will talk about later. And ultimately, it's, it's designed to reduce environmental impacts and improve the rehabilitation of lands disturbed from open mining. Course topics. What makes up the environment, especially within the Lightning Ridge uh, area, and how mining can impact on the environment. Also, we'll talk about laws briefly and the role of other departments and our department in, in mining, and also about minimising environmental impacts um, associated with open mining. At the end of the course, you hopefully will be able to understand your mineral claim conditions uh, a little bit better, especially the environmental conditions. And you'll also receive a certificate of attendance, which means that you have successfully discharged your responsibilities uh, with regards to the environmental awareness course condition on your claim. Um, a little bit about Australia um, and commodities. Australia is the world's largest exporter of coal, zinc, iron ore, uranium, as well as wool, beef, barley and sugar. Um, and our main customers, as you can see, there are China, Japan, US, Korea and New Zealand. Um, mining um, can have a, a, a fairly large impact and a lot of uh, these impacts are, uh, occurred um, in, the, in the distant past. And um, here's an example of, uh, of a, an asbestos mine that uh, opened in the 90s. Uh, the 1990s, that is, uh, at Barabara, northern New South Wales. And um, unfortunately, the, the company who ran that mine walked away when they got into financial difficulty. And the, the burden of the rehab of that mine now falls back onto the state and ultimately the taxpayers of New South Wales. These legacies are not confined to large-scale mining. They can be um, evidenced uh, around Lightning Ridge, as you can see, is an old open cut. Um, just to the south of town. Um, it has um, a large environmental footprint uh, within Lightning Ridge, but it also has a, a, a pretty, pretty high public safety risk too um, to those that live in camps nearby. Fortunately, uh, the department has rehabbed that site now, so that, that legacy is, um, is a, a thing of the past. <clears throat> you might have a um, a 50 by 50 metre mineral claim, but, um, and that you might think that claim uh, by itself hasn't got a big impact, but the cumulative impact of, of claims, um, adjoining claims, can have a, a quite a marked impact on, on the environment. And you can see here from a satellite Im image, you can see the three mile air um, near, the, uh, near the, the airport. Uh, it's clearly evident that the impact of mining on on the environment has. And if we drill further out, um, you can see the Cookran, the Nine Mile, and mining areas around Lightning Ridge. And, and just see how um, from satellite, Lightning Ridge is, is something that can be easily seen and its impact on the environment. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Mark Bucken, and he's going to talk a little bit more about um, mining and, in, and the, the natural environment around Lightning Ridge. Hello everyone. Uh, yep. Thanks Steve. Uh, Mark Bucken here. I'm an inspector environment for the resource regulator. What is the natural environment? I guess the natural environment encompasses all living and non-living things occurring naturally on earth. So this includes all your plants, your animals, your microorganisms, your soil, your rocks, water and air. So it's basically everything around you. Um, <clears throat> environmental damage. So how do we as humans, how do we impact on the environment? Um, overgrazing is a pretty uh, 
classic example of human impact, um, especially in the <coughs> semi-arid rangeland areas like like the ridge there. Um, when you have lack of rain and the overgrazing can, can lead to impacts where um, there's no vegetation left. The introduction of feral animals, the introduction of cats, especially this is a good example. Um, cats have a huge impact on the environment. Um, they have a big impact on the um, bird life and um, all the small mammals and lizards. Uh, soil erosion, this is another, uh, this is an example on a rehabilitation on a mining site, but it's a good example of how how water can really cause a lot of damage to the soil through large scale um, water flow events. So you can see here um, soil erosion through water impacts. Clearing, um, you can get a lot of impacts once again from clearing. Not, it's not only um, subject to areas out in bushland, but also clearing when you think about it, a lot of the urban areas have been cleared from natural vegetation too. So humans impact uh, on the natural environment in very, very many ways. Natural impacts. Um, and natural impacts is basically where the environment can be modified naturally um, by cyclones, floods and fires. Uh, that, luckily though, the environment will generally naturally recover by itself using plants and animals, especially adapted to um, survive the following type of disturbances. As you can see, that's a fire disturbance. Uh, other plants and animals follow as conditions become more favourable or until many years later, the environment is generally um, comes back to where it started from. Uh, a good example of this is, um, especially in the Lightning Ridge area, after a prolonged dry period, um, in 2006, there were some really good rains in the Lightning Ridge area. So that led to an abundance of um, growth of a lot of annual plants. Um, there was a high germination of wild mustard plants in the area. Although they were low on agricultural production, they were considered a pioneering plant because um, what they were able to do with that high volume of um, plants, I was able to create an ideal environment for a lot of the insects, which in turn turn out food, which in turn is food for lizards and bird life, etc. So it created a really positive for the environment, even though it wasn't considered a positive for uh, agricultural reasons. Um, now that's called succession. So I know this is a um, an example of a fire uh, impact on an area, but it's also a, also um, it's very similar to how mining activities, how mining disturbs an area. So you get a large removal of vegetation and soil. So you can see that here, the importance of um, the annual plants coming through the system, um, they create a positive environment that allows for the perennials and the grasses and that to come through. So this is an important process that needs to take place to help the re-establishment of the original landscape. So it takes a long time from that disturbing activities to really come back to where you've got an established community that was there in the, in the first place. So just be aware of as um, as a mining activities, yes, you will create disturbance, but just also be aware that it takes, it'll takes take a while for that area to, to come back to what it was prior to your mining activities. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm just going to pass you now back to um, Mr. Clipperton to discuss about the um, ecosystems and the rangelands of the Lightning Ridge area. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll just get the, the slide up. Okay, um, Lightning Ridge is is part of what is called a semi-arid rangelands ecosystem. Um, it's uh, semi-arid rangelands ecosystems um, have typically have a, an annual rainfall between 250 and 500 millimeters. They have a, a very a unique ecology that has evolved uh, to to um, inhabit the, uh, the, the dry semi-arid climate. Um, and so the soils, plants and animals uh, have specific adaptations to the, the, dry, the dry environment. And here we see a, a, a sand goer, a large sand goanna near Burke in, or in the Tilbury in New South Wales. Um, semi-arid plant communities are, are part of the, uh, the ecosystem. And these, these, um, these uh, semi-arid plant communities are usually dominated by a, 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 a very specific species that, that describes the community. And um, one of these plant communities around Lightning Ridge is the, the Mulga uh, plant community. And, um, and they're uh, 
they're, uh, they're again, we, we, we talk about why they're here and, and why they are part of the system. It's because they have, um, they have big root systems, hard leaves, thickened bark, and, and adaptations that, that suit them to the dry, dry climate. Um, here we have examples of the, the community uh, that you would typically see. Uh, mulga uh, can be found from the Queensland border right down to Grow and Glengarry. Um, the Coolabar black box communities uh, are typically found around the, the floodplains and the Cookman. Um, Bimbawaxa communities are a fan on the red ridges and, and typically around Lightning Ridge itself. Um, the northern floodplains um, are a vast treeless plain, which uh, um, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll probably observe coming up through um, Canamble and Walgett and further north. Um, the riverine, um, um, riverine communities are, are, are typically found on the Barwon River and, um, and the, Narran, the Narran Warrnambool systems uh, around the lake. Um, not so common, but uh, also, but they're very important all the same. Um, the iron bibble box uh, spinifex communities are, are common around Grawan and Glengarry and Barfield areas. Box hollows, um, yeah, very, very important, um, but very sensitive um, little habitats, and these uh, are protected um, during uh, in, in, in under claim conditions and and through our approvals. So, because they they um, they represent a sensitive environment, but they're also an environmental and and a public safety risk when you mine near them. Um, some of the the, the semi-arid plants and animals, are, like I said before, are typically um, adapted to the dry climate, and they um, they have these hard hard and small leaves and massive root systems and thick barks and seeds adapted to fire that. Um, that, uh, that germinate after fire, and, and the animals have bodily functions that uh, suit them to a to a dry climate. And um, and kangaroos are a typical example of that, where they'll reproduce uh, during during the good times, and they'll close their reproductive systems down in the hard, dry times. Um, habitat is essentially where animals live, and um, it can be. Uh, as large as a eucalypt wood, woodland or a mulga grove, or it could be under a rock, or it could be a piece of a puddle, or a, it could be under a branch um, or under bark. Um, habitat comes in all shapes and uh, shapes and sizes, and and as we can see in the picture here, um, we've got a picture of uh, a box hollow, which um, you need to be reminded of that. Uh, that uh, they are protected under claim conditions. So just remember, when you see a box hollow, you can't remove that tree. Um, habitat can be as simple as a small shrub. And here we, we have a butter, a small butter that's just above that cone in the centre. Um, you might think that's quite insignificant, but if we drill down a little bit closer, we can see that in the crook of that tree or that shrub, there's a nest and that nest belongs to uh, a protected species, which is the red cap wild robin. Um, the removal of habitat has the effect of damaging um, the environment for for the animals and plants that live in that in that environment. So what we've got now, because we've removed so much habit habitat in Australia, um, we have what we call threatened species. A lot of a lot of animals have become extinct there. You can see that over 20 mammal species have become extinct, extinct since uh, European settlement. But we've um, we've got threatened species which are protected by law, and and Mark and I, as regulators, need to be mindful of that. Now, examples of this um, can be communities of plants, um, and you can see the Coolabar black box woodland there, and they're they're protected by law in New South Wales by the Biodiversity Conservation Act, um, 2016. And sometimes species uh, are protected by the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, uh, which is a national act. Um, examples of threatened species, and I'll, I'll just move through these um, reasonably quickly. The busted, um, you don't see many of them around in New South Wales anymore. Um, the bushstone curlew, which is endangered. Um, uh, the uh, burrowing beton was one of the most... Um, 
a common marsupials in New South Wales pre-European settlement, but now it's extinct in New South Wales. Um, the Kultar, endangered. The Major Mitchell is listed as vulnerable uh, under legislation. Um, and we have um, the loss of hollow bearing trees is not necessarily a, a threatened species, but it's a it's a key threatening process. And and the re and it just it's it's listed as a key threatening process because it's been identified by by the government that um, we need to we need to we need to protect hollow bearing trees, and that's why their the removal is um, is banned under climb, uh, climb conditions. Now, um, an important part of the environment is, is not only the animals and plants that live in it, it's also culture. And, and culture in the form of prehistoric culture is often protected under law. And, and this can be in the form of um, artists, Aboriginal artefacts, scar trees and occupation sites. But culture is also important from a European perspective. Um, and historic old home, homesteads, old dams, weirs, yards, and graves can be listed under under uh, under heritage legislation uh, for protection. But we also need to be mindful, as as claim holders and regulators, of present day cultural uh, issues such as homesteads, proximity to homesteads, yards, bores, and dams. Um, it's all very important when mining. Mining encroaches on these areas. Uh, just an example of Aboriginal culture, which is uh, which is the scar tree. Um, European culture. Um, Fred Bodell's camp near Lightning Ridge. It's it's a classic example of how how opal miners lived back in the the, the turn of last century, and uh, and we can all visit these sites and 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 ponder over how how these how these old opal miners lived, and um, you can see an example of inside. Red's camp there. It has all the mod cons, but um, very simple and basic. But this is how people lived. You had a bottle collection there. Um, so, what have we learned about the environment? Of course, it's it's very complex and it's sensitive to change and very valuable. But what what we're trying to emphasise is that it's it's worth looking after and protecting. So, um, environmental conditions on claims aim in doing that. So um, I would like to hand over to Mark once again, and um, Mark's going to continue the, the presentation in terms of, um, of impacts from mining. Take it away, Mark. All right. Thank you, Steve. Impacts from mining. Okay, now, I guess when you talk about mining activities, most people sort of think about the large scale uh, impacts, like here's a good example of um, uh, impacts from coal mining. Yeah, look, it, it can be um, an extensive sort of disturbing activity when it's being undertaken, but it's also worth noting that, you know, there has been some large scale impacts like open cuts and Lightning Ridge. So here's a good example on Jag Hill where there was a large scale open cut. So it's not just, um, you know, impacts can actually be, uh, large scale impacts can actually occur in, in the Lightning Ridge area. So it's just not reserved for coal mining and and metalliferous mining. Um, <clears throat> impacts of opal mining on the soil. Uh, look, one of the, I guess the, the three big areas where um, the opal mining impacts uh, on the topsoil, it's, I guess it's through the loss of the topsoil, uh, that's through erosion or being smothered by opal dirt, it's compaction and it's subsidence. Uh, this picture here is a perfect example of, I guess a lot of those events occurring all at once. So where you've got the um, subsidence events there where um, someone's ballroom underneath and you just, the, the um, surface has just dropped into the void underground. So you've lost all that topsoil. And you can also see looking at that, there was actually um, a smothering of um, mullock dirt all over that claim as well. And you probably highly suggest that there was compaction activities there from a lot of vehicle movements. So that's a good example of impacts on the soil and lighting ridge from mining activities. Um, I guess this is a pretty typical soil profile for the Red Ridge areas. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a fairly shallow layer of red topsoil and subsoil over the weathered sort of bleached subsoil. Uh, that can also be called parent material, or as many would you when you bring it up, miners when they bring it up to the surface, consider that as mullock. Uh, it has very, that, that weathered white material has very low nutrient levels, and it's 
highly generally highly sodic so it makes it for a very poor growth medium so you want to avoid bringing as much of that white material and leaving it on the surface as possible uh, this is an example of smothering of the topsoil surface this was a claim that had a significant amount of mullock over it and the operator just thought they could spread all the mullock out over the ground to get that uh, claim cancelled however um, they were told they had to go back and remove all that dirt there was about i don't know 20 or 30 centimetres of white dirt spread over that. Uh, unfortunately, due to the, um, the the poor growth medium that it is, it's it's not viable having that that white dirt over the surface. Uh, it, it's just not conducive to a lot of the native plants. Uh, won't set seeds and won't won't grow in it. Uh, I guess anyone actually driving around through all those areas, all through the ridge area, you'll note that anywhere where there's white dirt stockpile, look, you might get a few things growing it, but not a lot of um, plants are actually. It's not conducive to a lot of plant growth. Um, this is uh, smothering due to silk dam failure. Uh, the environmental harm for this is a lot of that silt being so fine, it actually sets very hard. And so a lot of these seeds and all your vegetation just blow straight over that. And because it's hard setting, um, no plants will actually pop up through it. So this person, uh, this this was occurred from a, a silt dam. So the person who owned this silt dam was actually quite fairly costly to them as that to go out, had to clean all that up and had to rehabilitate, had intervention to rehabilitate it. So you want to get it right because it actually costs them a fair bit of money to actually repair all that those issues due to that silk dam failure. Um, this is just an example of, a, I guess, excessive stockpiling of uh, opal dirt on a claim. Uh, the biggest issue here is red, the red dirt is actually very susceptible to compaction. Uh, so that, um, that level of material on there will actually compact a lot of that um, soil underneath. So even though you might remove it, they'll still need some sort of intervention, intervention to actually reduce the compaction that's occurred on that soil. Uh, this is a good example of subsidence fence in the black soil. Uh, this is and this, this is a, an occurrence that happened in Jag Hill. Um, this was on the transition zone, so it just goes, just goes to show how uh, susceptible the, the black soil is in regards to it's very dispersive. And when, it, when they had a rainfall event there, the black soil just kept pouring, slaking down into um, the void underground. So that person who owned that claim they actually lost all their equipment underground. It cost, lost, it cost them a lot of money. They had to backfill it all in. Uh, so that's why there's a moratorium at the moment on mining in the black soil, just to the issues that can occur with it. Um, and here's a good example of um, the Kitty Hawk area. Um, <clears throat> probably not the best place in the world to park the vehicle, but this goes to show that this was actually rehabilitated two or three times um, prior to. So it just goes to show that anywhere, anytime there's a void underground in the black soil, the soil will just continue to slake down in there and open up and create issues. Uh, this is a major subsidence event from bore rooming. And if not all you're aware of what boring is, but if you take away too many pillars or don't put enough props underground, uh, you just get the surface, it just cracks and drops. So that's a whole area there where they've just taken too much material underneath and, and they didn't have enough props or pillars underground. So not only does it, does it cause issues with water ingressing into the ground, but actually it's dangerous. It just creates that, too many issues and you get a, a large depression in the area, uh, your loss of topsoil. So what's important for you guys for anyone is to recognize too that as a claim holder you're responsible for subsidence events so if this happens on your claim uh, you're actually responsible for the repair of this uh, <clears throat> so mining impacts on vegetation um, well it's a pretty good air indication there so generally it's a loss of vegetation due to over clearing on mineral claims uh, a big issue is the compaction of the soil due to vehicle movement and the spreading of white dirt, dirt across the surface and the spreading of, of weeds uh, here's, I guess, a, a good air, good overhead aerial showing um, vegetation loss. This, this is four mile deep. So this is the cumulative impact we have in regards to um, the impacts from smothering, compaction, and, and the removal of vegetation. So that area is starting to come back, but it's much, much slower. You can see in the background there all the native trees in the native area that hasn't been impacted by opal mining. So you can see that, that your 50 by 50 metre claim when it's all joined together, there's a, there's a, quite a cumulative impact. Uh, weed impact, so um, so that's your Hudson pear, the native veg. <coughs> Rehabilitation. Um, so I guess what we're looking at is the mined areas. So they need to have it needs to have a life after mining. Uh, so this might be cropping, grazing, or native vegetation. Out in the ridge area, generally your your final land use is going to be grazing grazing on native veg. Um, so your help is needed to make it happen. How? So that's by by planning ahead and thinking ahead. 
um, understanding the environment that you're mining in. Um, and there's quite a few simple rehabilitation techniques that help speed up the process and the restoration. Uh, one of the things I guess that's really important to point out is your claim conditions. They're actually a really good guide for a rehabilitation plan because they actually outline the rehab expectations for your claim um, at the end of mining. So it's really important that you read this. Various stages of rehab. So I guess this is a um, this is shows a rehab on a very large on a large area that's been impacted by coal mining in the um, I guess in the hunt in the um, Lithgow region. So what you can see, there's been a significant amount of um, soil works and and land forming um, to create this this landscape you're seeing there there now. Uh, a lot of work in regards to um, water control and, and to, to avoid soil erosion. So you can see how there's various stages of regrowth. As you can see in just in the front there, you can see how that there's um, a good establishment of young trees and shrubs. And in the foreground, you can see that it's recently we planted and there's a few little um, you know, seedlings and stuff coming up. So eventually that landform there, we were hoping, will be similar to the one you can see at the bottom of the hill because that's what it's going, going back to um, natural vegetation there. Um, in the Lightning Ridge area, it's some really simple um, remediation or veg veg rehab techniques um, can make a big difference. Um, this is an area where mining's um, been finalised. There's no more mining activities in there. And um, what they've done is they've just gone along and, and scalped uh, the little top cone layers from the backfield shafts, and they've just done some light ripping there. So what that's done is it's removed the excess white dirt from the surface, and it's broken up all the compaction. So that they're, by leaving that rough and ready, that allows a lot of the seed and moisture to get back into the soil, and that's going to really make all the difference in regards to helping that sort of come back and let a lot of vegetation grow back in there. Um, trapping resources. Now, nature's a, a wonderful thing. It actually does it on its own if you let it be. So this is a good example where, uh, dead, you know, just when there's something just as simple as something laying underneath the tree there, that, that catches a lot of the, the, the debris or the dead vegetation, um, it traps moisture and seeds, and it helps speed up recovery for that area. So here's a good example of just a log dragged across uh, a claim holder's claim once, it, once they've um, finished with it. And you can just see how that just after a rainfall event, how it's just trapped all that natural vegetation, that de debris and all that seed bank, and um, it main maintains the moisture there. And so you can see a lot of the plants already starting to grow up behind there. So something as simple as just actually dragging a log across after you've finished your mining activities can allow this activity to happen, which will, once again will help speed up that process of vegetation reestablishing over your uh, claim once you're finished. Um, some bad practices. Um, here's an example of a bad practice. Um, this is this is actually um, burning vegetation. This is actually prohibited on many claims. If you actually read your claim conditions, you're actually not allowed to burn vegetation. So just be actually aware of your claim conditions because if you do this, you could get in trouble. Uh, here's a really good example of um, a rehabilitated mullock dump. So once what was once a heap of white dirt, um, basically as you can see there, they've only so the, that rehabilitation techniques on here only really brought in a lot of. I guess you can say red graveling material. It's not even good material, but just by bringing in um, that red dirt over the surface of that mullock dump and having it rough and ready like that, it's allowed a lot of the seed bank and vegetation to, to come in and actually establish itself. So uh, I'm pretty sure if you drive through the ridge area, through the Lightning Ridge area and you have a look at most mullock dumps, they certainly don't look like that. So that's just a good example of how, how simple uh, um, rehabilitation of just spreading some uh, red gravelly material over an old mullock dump it's actually coming back really good and you wouldn't even notice that um, when you're driving past other than it's a hill on the ridge where there's not many hills on the ridge. Um, here's a good example of uh, large-scale rehabilitation activities in the ridge. Um, we saw earlier, I showed you uh, an example of a large open cut and jag hill. Well that's an open cut after it's been backfilled and the topsoil and, and a lot of the salvage trees and logs from that the initial clearing process will drag back over the top. So that's a really good example of how rough and ready and how bringing all that material back over the top will really help speed up the rehab process. Um, that's that exact area uh, 12 months later. And as you can see, there's a lot of um, germination of plants and um, already starting to come through. And if you actually go out and around that open cut, everywhere else is actually due to the compaction and vehicle movement, everywhere else is fairly denuded of vegetation. 
and that area actually looks quite good. So in a, by dragging across all the vegetation, leaving it rough and ready, it actually um, it stops people driving over the rehab areas as well, which once again helps speed up the vegetation growing and, and the rehab process. Here's a good example of, I'm pretty sure that this is that earlier picture where I showed you the large ballroom event occurred. Uh, this is a good example where it's been backfilled, uh, topsoil dragged over the top, a lot of vegetation dragged over. So you can see that's been left rough and ready. You can see the areas where the branches are and where there's any little hollows. You can see where the vegetation will. That's all the areas where the vegetation is re-established again. So once again, some pretty simple techniques of just, you don't have to reseed it. Um, nature will take its course, but you've got to just give it that opportunity for, for the natural systems to kick back in again. Uh, so rehab best practices. So once again, planning, thinking ahead, minimise vegetation removal, salvage your soil and all your push vegetations. Don't spread white dirt all over the surface and just try to remove as much as you can. Um, backfill your shafts and drill holes, remove excess mullet to approve dumps, remove all rubbish and machinery, control your water flows where needed. Um, and best practices, if you can just tickle up all those areas where you've been, all the compacted areas, try to rip them all up and re-spread all your stockpiled soil and vegetation back over the site. So leave it rough and ready. So that's it doesn't take much intervention to try to um, help speed that process back up to, for rehabilitation. I'll just now put you back across to Steve and he'll talk to you about the government and mining laws. Thanks, Mark. I'll um I'll just I'll just share my screen again um, and um, get this up and going. There we go. Now this is the the final final component of the of the presentation. So we're on the on the last stretch. I want to talk a little bit about um, um, mining laws and government laws that influence mining. It's uh, it's it's probably not a very inspiring topic, but it's very important in terms of of the way you manage your your claims. Now, mining in New South Wales is governed by uh, all these all these acts of Parliament. Um, the, the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act is very important in, in terms of approval for mines, not necessarily mineral, mineral claims, but approval for large-scale mining. Um, the Protection of the Environment Operations Act is the EPA. Uh, the EPA um, administer and regulate pollution through that act. Um, the Biodiversity Conservation Act uh, governs um, 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 the, uh, the protection of threatened species. Uh, Water Management Act and the Water Act uh, govern um, uh, the way that that water is allocated and licensed across New South Wales, and and Fisheries uh, Fisheries Management Act and the Local Land Services Act have, have minor roles within mining. But first and foremost, the Mining Act is the is the uh, Act of Parliament that uh, has most influence on on the way that you mine um, in in Lightning Ridge. Now. The, the Mining Act empowers the Minister for Resources, who is our minister, to impose conditions on mineral claims. Now, uh, these conditions um, mostly aim to protect the environment and require that mine land is rehabilitated. So they're, they're two really important areas that, that Mark and I regulate, um, protecting the environment and rehabilitation of, of the uh, environment. Um, the Mining Act also empowers the department to require security. So uh, that's why you uh, you pay uh, seven hundred and fifty or seven hundred dollars generally for a for a as, a as a bond on a on a mineral claim because that that uh, there they are conditions that are imposed on mineral claims. And if you want to if you want to undertake uh, further activities on your mineral claim like trenching, um, you may have to pay more securities. But um, this, these securities are, are put in place so as uh, if you do walk away from your claim, then then your um, your security uh, is is then used to rehabilitate your your claim um, after you leave by the department. Now, the Mining Act um, the Mining Act uh, empowers us to regulate these conditions and Mark and I uh, do come to Lightning Ridge quite often 
and we do do sweeps on on around claims and fields and we do uh, determine whether you've rehabbed in accordance with your claim conditions and and whether that rehabilitation is is of a standard that that we can release security so I think um, I think all claim holders should be mindful of that that at any given day uh, an inspector um, may may um, drive past their claim and and undertake compliance inspections on their claim um, Go through some of the mineral claim conditions, and um, and some of them um, might be familiar with you to you, but some of them might not be. So uh, here we have Wyoming. I know that uh, several of you uh, will have claims in Wyoming. So um, there's a there's a condition that requires you to undertake a, a mine safety awareness course, but also the environmental awareness course prior to prior to mining. Um, you can see there that there's there's quite a few, uh, quite a lot of environmental conditions that that relate to how you mine on your claims in in lot in, in in Wyoming. Um, the size of trees that can be removed, uh, the damage to uh, re and removal of hollow bearing trees is is um, is banned in 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 Wyoming. Um, you can't undertake mining in a way that that uh, causes subsidence. So these these are all things you need to be mindful of uh, prior to mining. Read your claim conditions. Barfield, similar. You have to uh, undertake a, uh, an environmental awareness course and a mine safety awareness course prior to mining. Um, there's conditions relating to the amount of money, money you can store. Um, there's conditions of how much uh, area of your claim that you can disturb. Uh, there's, there's conditions relating to um, burning of vegetation, as Mark was talked about before, that vegetation, removed vegetation, is is to be used at re in rehabilitation and not burnt. OPA four, um, similar. Um, if you're if you're mining on Weewarra or, uh, or any of those areas, um, you have to do an environmental awareness course. But you also have to be mindful of of a lot of other environmental conditions that relate to to mining in OPA4. Um, there, there's quite a few. There's quite a few conditions, but, but the take home message for Mark and I is read your claim conditions. They're very important. Um, another important plan, which doesn't tend to be administered by Mark and I, but it's a requirement from you uh, to abide by the Access management plan, which has signed, is been signed off between the the association um, and the landholder. And there's some basic fundamental rules that you have to abide by when you enter onto um, a landholder's property. And in this in this situation, this is Barfield. So, what tracks can be used? When can you access the property? When you can't access the property? That sort of thing. What speed you can travel on? Um, some fundamental rules that, that have been put in place. Um, so you you should uh, familiarise yourself with that. And if you don't, there's copies of it at the Lightning Ridge uh, Miners Association office uh, or at the department um, for you to to read and possibly get a copy of. This is. Um, these are mentioned in your claim conditions. Water courses are often mentioned. This is an example of a water course. It doesn't necessarily have to be a large river or a creek. It can be a, a, a drainage line. But these these features in the landscape impact on mining, especially underground mining. So, and then and they're important because they direct water from one area to another. And it's a, it's a common complaint that we get from landholders that that someone a, a land hold, I mean a claim holder above them in the upslope is directing water into their claim and causing ingress of water into underground working. So just be mindful that we don't mine in these areas. Anyway, I guess uh, there's a that's the end of the course at the moment and I'd like to, to thank you for um, taking the time to listen in. Um, but the take home message, uh, I guess, from myself, but Mark, Mark can back this up himself, is to plan to minimise the disturbance to soil and vegetation and this will make rehabilitation much easier after mining. So go find heaps of this stuff.
and um, I wish you well in your endeavours. And I, I guess I'll hand it back over to Mark, and he can he can concur. Thank you, Steve. Okay, everyone. Um, hopefully, this presentation has been both practical and um, usable for you all. So, thank you very much, and hopefully, we'll see you out in Lightning Ridges sometime. Thank you.